MailChimp actually is quite awesome. Okay, so <laughs> our software is more awesome, but MailChimp <laughs> is very cool. Okay, so a little bit of propaganda first of all. Who are HTK? So I, I co-own HTK. Um, where the dot 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 is, that's us. So it's on the waterfront, um, three-story warehouse with lots of restaurants, which is quite nice, and boats. Um, and we do this MailChimp is email. We do omni-channel stuff, so it's all about how you join up all your different marketing channels together, um, which is important. I mean, you guys talk about SEO a lot, and it's about your website and your search marketing, your content marketing, it's tying the whole thing together. So we talk a bit about email tonight, but we're also gonna talk about a few kind of basics of marketing, which hopefully you'll nod and say, I'm not talking nonsense, um, but just bringing this back into overall your marketing strategy as well. So we have all kinds of customers, uh, big ones, Telefonica, bits of government, and smaller businesses as well, because they all, funnily enough, have the same challenges, which is how you can engage more meaningfully with your audience or audiences using email and other, other channels as well. Right, so successful email marketing. Um, what's happening in industry, first of all? Why are we talking about this? Um, there's been a lot of that, first of all. I mean, it, it's a relevant message, but it's a little bit interruptive. And um, would you be pleased? So this is my equivalent of marketing, email marketing spam, which is just bombarding people with something they really didn't necessarily want to get. Um, why is that bad? And why is email marketing still kind of relevant? Well, e-consultancy, big organization, they do lots of, subscribe to their stuff, they write all kinds of interesting articles. Um, this is the 2014 report, a few months old now, but again, email marketing's taken the top spot again compared to SEO. As a channel, as a marketing channel, it's doing really well. 23% of sales, 16% of budget. It is performing quite well, getting bang for your marketing buck. But look at this. Only 3%, and this is, they surveyed hundreds of email marketers, right? And only 3% said they were doing an excellent job. And only less than half thought they were doing a good job, which means over half of marketers doing email are going to work every day thinking they're doing a bad job. What can we do? And why is this? So this is the chart, the, the blue line is, uh, which channel or which things are most effective to do? And the, and the beigey colored one is which of them are most tricky. Um, we're gonna focus on the top one largely, which is creating relevant, compelling content. Most marketers know it's really, really vital to do, and we'll talk about why, but they find it really hard. So we'll decompose up, unpick it as to why it's hard, how we can make it easier. The rest of it, we come in some stats on the rest of it, but, but really the most important thing is how you create relevant, engaging content. Why do you need to do that? I'll just leave you to read. This is from, from Return Path, a big US company who's lots of stuff on email deliverability, which is your ability to get your email, you're the sender here, all the way through this to a subscriber's inbox, which used to be easy in the olden days. And what's happened now is that all the in internet providers, like you know, Google, Gmail, Microsoft, all these guys, put all these things in the way of you getting to someone's inbox. Um, you know, once you've done your content, you've got your list and your segments, you send it, and they've got all these you know, stuff for anti-phishing, anti-spamming, anti-everything. You've got white lists, black lists. If you get on a black list, you're not gonna get anything sent to anybody. And then it comes through to the ISP, uh, and you've then got filtering there. You know, Google's got its priority inbox, and it's stuff it sees as being promotions. Or you might get in someone's junk folder. And why does that happen? Well, these days, it's all about this bit here. Whether you get, if you get all the way through to their email account, whether you get in the inbox or junk, depends largely on engagement. Every time you open somebody's email, let's say you're using Gmail, we use Gmail at work. Let's say you're using Gmail from Google. What is Gmail looking at? So every time I open the email, it knows I've opened it, obviously. Every time I reply to an email, or click on a link, but particularly things like replies and, and it sees as a signal that, oh, that email was valuable to Justin. How does email normally work? You know, you receive an email, you open it, you read it, you maybe reply to it because it's sent from your friend and they're talking about shoes and you like shoes, so you reply to the email. Or there's something in it which they've said, this is interesting, you click a link, because if you click something, you maybe there's something valuable, interesting for you in the email. All those signals tell Google that that email's interesting. 
how does most email marketing work? People spam stuff at you and it hits your inbox, you do nothing with it. Work. Do nothing with it. Which is a signal to, to Google that this wasn't interesting or relevant at all. So engagement becomes really, really important. So um, how do you do that? How do we create relevant, engaging, compelling content? First thing to do. We've got to think about our audiences. So people. You've got a list, hopefully one that you've grown yourself and not bought because that's bad. And buying a list, by the way, I'll say this several times, buying a list, don't ever buy email lists from third parties. You can get a thousand emails for five pounds. Don't, because again, what's gonna happen is you're gonna send an email to those dudes and they haven't got a clue who you are. They're not gonna open your emails or they're gonna flag them as spam. All affects deliverability. It's all signals to, to the ISPs that in fact your overall emails, you as a sender, are rubbish and uninteresting and boring because a bought list will never open and click your stuff and every time that happens, it's a signal to the ISPs that what you do is bad. Um, anyway, audience, people, they're all different, aren't they? Bill, he's happy, he's old but, uh, than me, slightly. Um, and, and, and Mike is his son who's just borrowed his hat. Um, but what's right for Bill may not be right for, for, for Mike. Um, Bill is a businessman when he's at work. And then when he's at work, he's going to be looking for his business things. When he's at home, he's going to be looking for holidays and shoes. Um, Mike is obviously unemployed. Um, <laughs> but he likes hats. And he has disposable income, which he gets from his dad, Bill. They're very different people. If they're both subscribed to your newsletters, they'll probably want different things. Um, so Mark, first marketing term, who's come across as a marketer, persona-based marketing? Anybody? In? Right, so some hands. Personas. What is a persona? Think of your ideal customers. Let's say I, I have a shoe shop. I, I will, how many of you are B2C, business to consumer businesses? B2B, so you're selling to, right, so you're selling to businesses. Okay, so let's think about businesses. So we serve different sectors. So we serve local government, central government, hospitality, so hotels and leisure parks and things, retailers. I would not send the same email to a retail prospect that I send to local government. There'd be less swearing for a start, but, but it's totally different. They want different things. A business wants to make money. Government doesn't want to make money. My messaging has to be totally different. So, but for you, for your business, who are your ideal kinds of customers? We had two there, you know, Bill the businessman. He's an older dude. He, he's more responsible in his job, and he's got different challenges to, to, to Mike. Um, but for your business, have a think, you know, what kinds of customers have you got? What are their key characteristics? Um, how can you say, well, we, yeah, we have our old customers and, and they want reassurance that what they're doing is right. We've got our younger customers on the whole and they just want a bit of fun. Whatever it might be, it's kind of painting a pen picture of your ideal, typical customer or customer types. What are their wants and needs and pains? It's really good to do this on paper. Now, what does Bill want? Fundamentally, what does he want from your emails versus Mike? Because sure as eggs is eggs, what they don't want it's the same right as you, I'm sure you've talked about content marketing and your website. Your website's there to sell, but how do you get people engaged with your website? It's not by saying, buy my things, they're amazing. Because people, when they first come to your website, don't know they want to buy your things. They're probably trying to solve a problem of some sort. Same deal here. You've got to really get into the shoes of your, of your typical kinds of customers, the kinds of guys who buy from you. Think what those different kinds of customers want from the emails that they're graciously going to sign up to receive from you. To start with, it's probably not going to be to be sold to. Here's an example. So mid-twenties Mike. You get the idea. This is a B2C one. Apologies for that. But, you know, he's got a description. He's got behavior. You know, he's, he's not on the trends, but he likes to set them himself. And he's got disposable income. And he buys niche online stuff. Um, and um, what it, but it's really getting into under the skin of this guy where he spends his time when he's online what he spends money on, what he doesn't spend money on. If it's a business, it'll be things like, what does that person need to do in their job to improve that, you know, to impress their boss to get a promotion, often. So, you know, if it's a marketing exec, what they want is to show they're doing really amazing things to their boss to get a promotion. If it's, a, if it's, a, if it's the boss, he doesn't want to get fired, often. Um, but they'll want different things. Get under the skin of them. Think about their wants, their needs, their pains, what keeps them awake at night. How do you get started with that? Get your marketing and sales teams 
in the same. How many of you guys have marketing and sales teams? You are your marketing and sales team. Okay, <laughs> that's you've got a head start. So you're already the same person. Because often when you're selling to people, big businesses, these guys don't talk, they just fight a lot, which is rubbish because they actually need to be talking. Because the sales guys, you've got frontline, coal face experience of what kinds of customers they've got. Yeah, we have the, the uh, would I say the same to a chief exec as, as to that guy? No, of course I wouldn't, no. This guy walks in, I can see he's a chief exec, I'm going to sell him the expensive thing. Whereas the young guy, I'll sell him the thing I can upsell him later on. Your sales guys know this already subconsciously. But um, start thinking about it. Um, write them down, get comfortable with them. If this is a pen and paper exercise. This isn't the digital exercise. This is just get, get some A4 paper and post-it notes out and start thinking. What are the different kinds of customers that, I, that buy stuff from me? Forget everyone who might want to buy stuff from me, who you think might buy stuff in the future. Think through the guys who have bought from you in the last 12 months. Characterize them. What different, if you've only got one niche kind of customer, that's easy. Because then you can be really niche with your messaging. But if you've got different kinds of guys who bought from you, write it down, draw a pen picture. Think about what they want, need, and where they're suffering pain. And then go start looking for sources of data within your business. Organically <coughs> grow it, don't do the other because of that. Um, to identify these kinds of people. And that then comes down to data. We've done the pen and paper bit. This comes down to data now. So this is what happens. I see marketing all the time. So um, you can avoid this in MailChimp, and I'm sure you do, because it can be awesome. Um, this is what happens often, though. People have all this data. You've got data on your website. You've got your e-commerce systems. Um, you've got your CRM system. You've got your ERP. You've got whatever. You've got your purchasing and account system, the thing you generate your invoices every month from. You've got all this data sitting in those. Um, and it comes into this thing called Excel, which is miserable. And you end up then cutting and dicing spreadsheets and trying to dedupe them and import them and do all this miserable stuff. As a result, it gets very difficult. And, you, and you, you give up and you get one or two lists. You've got your lists. And you then start shooting and blasting people with them, which is bad. Um, don't do that. It's shit. Um, but. <laughs> But you can avoid that. You can, do, you, can do, um, you can do stuff to bring it all together, whether it's all in one single database, um, which is what I do, or, or into another platform like MailChimp. doesn't matter, but try and bring stuff together into one place where you've got like, a proper database for your marketing, not just a whole bunch of lists. If you have a whole bunch of lists, you've got things like, again, let's say you're a business. You've got maybe people who signed up for that certain event, and you've got people who are your customers and you've got maybe people who are your prospects. And sending to those is fine independently, but when you want to say, okay, well, how many of my customers came to that event? It can all get horrible if you're not careful. So you need to organize your data in whatever system you're using in such a way that you can interrogate it and query it and say, how many people have I got who did this but haven't done that for a while? Or how many people have I got who have logged on to my software in the last 30 days, or, or more importantly, haven't logged onto my software in the last 30 days, whose contracts come up for renewal? Because they might be a churn risk. You know, forget trying to maybe make more money by selling to new people. Think about existing customers too. What are you doing to existing customers? Are they still consuming your products or services when they're coming up to a contract renewal? Because if they're not, maybe there's, there's a churn risk there. Maybe some revenue you need to protect. Bring all your data on your prospects, your existing customers together. Here's an example. This is, this was, um, who was this? This was ZZ. There we go. So you can capture data in all kinds of ways. You can have preference centers on your website where people sign up and say what they're interested in. You can, if you're a business, again, your content marketing, which I'm sure you've talked about, create white papers, top of the funnel content, useful, that solves people's problems. Not about your business or your products, just stuff that helps people solve their problems. Make it freely available, or maybe put it behind a little email data trap. Get the fifth guide on the 15 most important things of the shoemonger you should be doing, whatever it might be. Um, and, and shoemongers will flock to it and they will download it. And, and in exchange for their email address, if that's a generally valuable, helpful piece of content to them, they'll probably give their email address. Basics of content marketing. But use data traps, things, competition surveys if you're B2C. It can be really cool. Um, paper forms, if that's your kind of business. It doesn't matter where you capture this stuff, but use any opportunity you can to get people's permission to send them stuff. Um, obviously, it has to be something in it for them and a reason for them to do it. This is easy, though. Look what they're doing. They ask you for things like your email address. 
but they also ask you this stuff here, look. Um, how many kids under 12 have you got? How often do you eat out? Um, when was the last time you visited them? They're using all this stuff to create different personas. You know, the, the family dude and the guy who lives on his own and can't cook. Um, don't want to, no, that's probably not one of their ideal customers. But um, they, they use all this stuff to create different personas because then their marketing from then on is going to be very different because they're going to be sending <coughs> the guy with the family family offers and maybe weekend things, maybe at five o'clock because they're the early crowd because the kids have to be in bed by seven. Um, and then they've got the later crowd who get the voucher culture stuff who they know will only ever buy off vouchers. Very, very different audiences. So, okay, why do you do all that stuff? So you then create segments in your database. MailChimp does this really, really well as well. It can do it. Um, you can segment on all kinds of things. Recency of sign-ups, value of spend. MailChimp's got amazing e-commerce plugins too for tracking e-commerce stuff. Um, all kinds of things you can do. Um, to create segments like this, there'll be some overlap, but then you, ideally you send stuff to the different kinds of people. You don't blast and shoot everyone the same. You, you choose your, your segments, which might be based on your personas, maybe different stuff, but personas are a good place to start. So you can send different things to these different kinds of audiences. For the guy here who's doing fine art, that's going to be the, the local you know, people who might come into the gallery. It might be the guys who or in the States with money, but stupidity as well, because all Americans are stupid, and the Americans in the room. Um, um, and then you've got your art critics and so on. We all want different things out of, out of marketing. Here's some stats. MailChimp, um, funnily enough, did this study, recently updated, February, um, on segmented versus non-segmented campaigns. So they looked at everybody, all the millions of people who use MailChimp, and looked, okay, who are the guys who are, who are actually targeting their campaigns, and who are the guys who just send you to a whole list? And they looked at open click-through rates, spam abuse reports, which is people flagging the spam button, and unsubscribes. Look, opens, 13% higher. How much higher was click? So clicks, higher or lower? Do the Brucey. <laughs> higher. How much higher? How much of a percentage increase on click-throughs do you think they got from a segmented list compared to a non-segmented list? 40%. 40 higher than that. Look, 62%. Whoa. I know. <laughs> Abuse reports were down. Unsubscribes were down. This is recent data from squillions of people. So it actually, this stuff actually works. Um, takes a little bit more time, but actually works. Okay, so we've got our data sorted. We know we've got to create some personas. We know we've got to send some targeted emails to different audiences. Um, we've done the relevant bits because we know that what we're going to be saying to our different audiences, it's probably going to be relevant to them because we've done the persona exercise, we know what they want, needs, and pain points are. How do we make it compelling? Because the best targeting in the world will be a waste of time if what you send them is awful. Um, so how do we make stuff compelling? Right, well, the landscape has changed. Look at this. I mean, it's a little bit... Um, actually, this goes up to February, so it's new. Um, mobile is still massive. Look, 48% uh, of email opens now are on mobile devices. Um, web mail's coming up, that's because Gmail now again opens images by default, it's moved up again a bit. Um, desktop is generally declining, uh, mobile is, is going to stay huge. So you know you need to be doing mobile responsive email, the same as your mobile responsive website. What does that mean? Well look, there's some other stats from Americans because they are not as, let's say, as, as, as intelligent as us Westerners. Um, but 63% of them will, will delete an email if it's not optimized for their mobile device. Astonishing. Here's the world's longest mobile device. Um, but this is, from, this is from Waitrose. Apologies again, it's B2C, but Waitrose do this really, really nicely. Um, as do um, as a few companies um, do it. But Waitrose are worth signing up to. I'm trying to think who else it is. I can't think of it. It's one of the ones you do fancy hampers and stuff. Do this beautifully as well. But look. Um, it's basically taking your email, same as a website. You can do slightly less with mobile responsive on email than you can with websites, but basically you can hide stuff, you can make stuff do that or do that. You can get images shrink and expand to the full width, um, and you can change. You've got some star CSS style sheets. You can basically, if it's a mobile, give it a style sheet and some media queries. Do some jiggery pokery. Less than you can with a website, but you can do quite a lot. Okay, so let's take a look. How do you construct an email that's going to work pretty well the way that Waitrose do it? Or the way that HubSpot do it? I mean, again, a good B2B marketing company. So, tell a story. It is all about stories. People don't want to be sold stuff. They want to... The human brain's wired to understand stories. 
And, and people, that's why people use case studies, always have used case studies, because people like stories. Social proof, really, really important. These days it's gone bananas. You know, if, the, if you're going to look to buy anything for your business or, or your family, what's the first thing you do now? If it's a holiday, you'll jump on TripAdvisor. If it's for your, if it's for your home, you'll, you'll look at the comments on argos.co.uk or whatever and see do other, do other people think that print is good or not. Um, if it's for your business, again, you'll typically look at trusted reviews or one of these sites to see is, is this thing shit or is this thing great. You're not going to ask the, the vendor to tell you that stuff in the way you used to because now we've got Google and we can look this stuff up and people are telling everybody everything because they're people. Sell, inform, entertain. Again, the Americans have known this for ages. It has to be entertaining as well as informative. People have a short amount of time. Unless they find it a gripping read, they're not going to bother. Um, writing in small chunks. This is because everyone's increasingly becoming more and more stupid the younger they get. Have you noticed this? Younger generations aren't as intelligent as us. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, but you look at the BBC News website, they write in kind of one sentence per paragraph. It's because people skim read these days. People's brains are slowly being rewired to skim read. That's thanks to Twitter and, and FaceTube. Um, people no longer read books end to end. Um, first two words of any sentence are really important because you're skimming down something. The first couple of words your brain takes in, consciously, subconsciously. But the first couple of words, if they find a hook there, they might read the rest of your sentence and you'll be lucky. Um, Conversational tone can fit well. Typically these days, it's about, again, the story, humanizing your business. People these days like human businesses on the whole. Um, and you've got a structure for this. Merit points for anyone who knows what that stands for in marketing speak. I'll give you a clue. Attention. You've got to get people's attention, first of all. Unless you've got their attention, you've wasted your time creating that beautiful piece of content you sent by email. That's things like, how do you get someone's attention? That's things like the from name, the friendly name of your email when it comes through, which if they don't recognize, which is why you shouldn't buy from a list, because if you bought a list from somebody, they've never heard of your brand. You send a thing through from high street shoemongers, they've never heard of you. They're never going to open your email. The subject line, really important for getting someone's attention. There's been lots of studies on short subject lines, long subject lines. On the whole, it's got to be on the whole pretty, pretty short or pretty long. Short because it's catchy, longer because it's more descriptive of what's actually in the email. Um, so under 50 characters maybe, or un under 40 characters maybe, or over 70. Um, the middle is a bit of a grey area, but hey, it depends. Um, the pre-header. Anyone know what the pre-header is? It's this bit, if you're on a mobile and you open your inbox on a mobile phone, you see the subject line and then you see the next bit of text, which is the first bit of text that Apple, in my case, read from that email. And they give you that under the subject line. If that first part that you see under the subject line is, can't view this email, click here to view in a browser, they know it's a marketing email, they're probably not going to open it. So you can have this thing called a pre-header, which you put in at the top of the email, just a bit of additional text. So that when someone's viewing that in their mobile inbox, they see the subject and something enticing underneath it. Interest, next thing. So again, subject line, main heading, <coughs> first few words. You've got, same as a web page probably, a um, few seconds to get someone's interest. Are they going to read this email a bit more or not? Because it's email, because we're all bombarded, we get hundreds of emails a day. If they don't read it then, they're probably not going to come back to it later on. Um, so you've got to really think about how you get their interest in the subject line and the main heading. Desire, facts, figures, testimonials, emotions. Try and elicit an emotional response from this stuff. Um, what's the final A? Anyone know? Action. Right, absolutely. Same as your website. It's no good at all unless you get someone to take some action to convert in some way. So, some kind of call to action. Let's take a look. So, here's our Waitrose email again. It's beautiful. I've, I've split it up into two columns there just because that's the shape of the page. Um, what have they done? Pre-header. I, I, I forget, forgive me, I didn't get the subject line of this one. I didn't put it on the slide. But they've got a pre-header there, which um, is very small. But it's discovering, discover our fabulous fish suppers. Who wouldn't want to read that? It sounds amazing if they've targeted well and it's going to the, to the cooks out there. But they've got a pre-header, which is good. Get marks for that. Interest. They've got a picture now of a person. Picture of people work really well, as you know, on your website, because people respond to human faces on the whole. Well, our brains are wired to that. And look, if you scan into that guy with the fish and think, why is that guy with the fish? The next thing you see is that he's looking across there um, and he's looking at what's in that email, which is quite a cute little mental trick they're playing there because your brain will home in on him and then what he's looking at. Um, 
whether they did that on purpose or, or just got lucky, I don't know, but I like this kind of stuff, and it's how the brain works. So they've got interest, they've got their table of contents, they've got then all the code you might see in, the ready, set, bake, that sounds exciting. I love things like that. Um, Mother's Day afternoon, you can scan it. Um, they've got little short chunks. The desire is there. Um, get ready to spoil a lovely mum, a bit more about the fabulous fish suppers. They actually are using you know, some nice descriptive language to make you want to dive in a bit more, and then of course they give you the strong call to action, which is great. Um, also they've got the stuff at the bottom here, which just links to their website. If you're doing this with your email marketing, it's a really useful tip. On your website, you will have your main primary navigation, which typically has got things like your products, your services. Look at what's in that. Add those things as kind of, whether it's the top of your emails or the bottom of your emails. Even if it's not about those things, just, just list them there. Because you'd be amazed at how many people just maybe open your email, and once you've got a relationship with them, a report, and, they th and, and you'll find people just clicking stuff that was nothing to do with email, but they think it just um, touches a nerve or they jogs their mind. We do this for hotels all the time. We'll send out like a wedding list or to a wedding audience about the wedding fairs, things like that. Um, and you get people looking through at rooms, and you think, oh, okay, they're quite serious because look, they're now looking at rooms as well. Um, people are what they click. You can do your preference centers, and people, if it, particularly through things like surveys, um, or just tell us what you thought of that email. Or t you, know, you can get people to tell you stuff by clicking buttons. But people on the whole are what they click. So look at all the links in your email. And again, I'm sure MailChimp does this as well. Um, and use this behavioral data, the kinds of things people are clicking on, can also give you really interesting cl clues about what they're interested in. Maybe some follow-up emails. We'll talk about that in a second. And of course, if you've been doing this well, you still get situations where people quietly go away. Um, for whatever reason, sometimes people just move on, they move out of the area, or they just have a new shoemonger that they're going to, whatever it might be. Um, it is important to do this, because this is, about, this is about when you see people quietly slipping away, how you could potentially try and bring them back. There's a great example from Crocs. Um, it's been a while. So what they do is they send this, to people who haven't opened their emails for about six months. Um, and I expect they cross-reference with people who have or haven't bought this stuff from, the, from their store as well. It's been a while. Um, we hope you enjoy receiving the Crocs email. We'd like to continue, s we'd like to continue sending exclusive email promotions, uh, social blah, 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 blah. But they tell you what they want to carry on doing. They remind you of why you signed up in the first place. And then they ask you to verify that you still want to receive the stuff, and they give you a voucher off. So what they're doing here is, again, it's the whole what's in it for me thing. They are identifying the people who are quietly slipping away. They're not trying to sell to them anymore. They want to just bring these people back in and say, look, you signed up once for our special offers and promotions. We're still awesome. Do you still want us? If you don't, if they don't, you know, then they won't click that. And what will Crocs do? They'll probably just suppress them from the list. Fair play, guys had his chance, doesn't want our stuff anymore, stop sending. The, the, the natural reaction is to say, no, it's all about the size of my list, and a big list is better than a small list. But no, it's actually not. A small engaged list is better than a big unengaged one, because as we saw, if you send, Karen send it to your list of thousands, and they're not opening your emails, they'll eventually just get so fed up that you're still sending them, that they'll start flagging you as spam. Um, which is bad because you can then get blacklisted. So if you've got people who haven't been opening your emails for a while, stop trying to sell them, switch the conversation around, just start reminding them why they signed up in the first place, see if you can win them back. Right, so we talked a bit about creative, we talked about data, how are we going to get successful with this stuff, set some objectives, in fact some smart objectives. We all know what smart means, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time bound, all that stuff um, like this. You know, start with the end in mind. Think about what you want your email to achieve. Uh, I want to sell 100 pairs of shoes, or I want to w get an extra 10 grand in the business next quarter from this particular segment of customers. Or I want to get 100 people to download my white paper on the state of the XYZ industry, because I know from my content strategy that after that I can then start talking to them about, more specifically, my products. Whatever it might be, think about what, um, your business wants to achieve and couch it in those very specific terms. And then we need to start looking at measuring what matters. Now, this is something that too many email marketers get um, 
a little bit wrong, I think. So we've got some standard metrics here. Things like delivery rate and, and open rate. They're useful. Uh, I'll show you some stats in a second. Bounces, um, hard and soft. Soft bounces are fine. It just means that so the recipient says, I don't know who you are. Send again in a few minutes. You send again in a few minutes. It's fine. The Russian spammers don't do that. Sorry, uh, not just Russian. There are other spammers as well. And not necessarily the Russians either. Um, bounce rate uh, opens between 15 to 30 percent um, is is about average. Um, I'll show you some stats on that. You can get much higher with a very targeted list. Um, clicks is probably the best indicator of the general, ge general stats. Uh, clicks is good. You want clicks. Clicks tells the ins uh, internet provider that this email has been opened with that your stuff is interesting. Um, Social shares, four to a friend, no one uses that ever, don't worry about it. People use social sharing now instead. Most systems have it, it's a waste of time. Um, unsubscribes, um, don't obsess on unsubscribes, obsess more about clicks and engagement because people often won't unsubscribe, they're too lazy. Um, they will just get your email, think, another one, uh, delete it. Next month, another one, delete it. Eventually they'll think, I'm still sending this email, spam. So. Your unsubscribe rate might be quite low. If your click rate is quite low, also be concerned. Um, spam complaints you want to get rid of. Less than 0.01 of a percent you want of those. If you get too many spam complaints, which is people clicking the flag a spam button, which unfortunately these days is much easier often than unsubscribing, because it's a prominent link, often built into the email software. Get too many of those, what will happen? Well, most of the big internet providers now sign up for things like Spam Cop and Spam House <coughs> and all these services, which are run by third parties who monitor spam complaints. And what will happen is your email passes through their filters on the way to the inbox. Um, if you've been getting too many um, spam complaints, <coughs> systems like Spam Cop, third party system, nothing to do with Gmail or Outlook or anything, will blacklist you. And it, what happens is your email goes into the gmail.com inbox, and they will talk to SpamCop and say, is, this, is the sender a good sender or are they a spammer? And they will either say, no, it's a spammer, uh, put you into junk, or in the worst case, they'll say, no, they're a spammer, um, and then your emails <coughs> won't get through. Um, the ch trouble with that is if you send bulk emails from your corporate email server, your exchange server at work, if you have one of those things, and, you, d and you have that, then you're talking to your CEO about why no one in your business can send emails anymore which is uh, very bad for your career prospects. So, <laughs> so always send through some kind of email provider, um, not from your own email server, if you're doing big bulk stuff, because the consequences are always be bad. Here's a trend, it's a little bit out of date, but you can see on average, this is kind of uh, UK, 21% across all industries um, for, for uh, uh, open rates and 6.9% for click-throughs. Um, doing targeted stuff, you should be way, way above that, you should be getting sort of 30, 40% open rates up to maybe 8, 9, 10% engagement. Um, but you can see some averages there. Now, merging what really matters. This is vanity. I mean, these are the kind of charts you get. Opens and clicks. Warning. Uh, it's not so bad for you guys, because I guess you're kind of working for yourselves. Um, but if you have a boss, and you go into your boss and say, that campaign we did, we got 65,000 clicks. Your boss will then ask a very difficult question, which is, well, how much money has that made us? Um, I'm not sure, but we've got lots of clicks. <laughs> Probably doesn't really care. What they care about is money. Um, and what you should care about is money. So start thinking about, well, your business. So your business makes money, typically, by serving customers. So you get prospects. And they go through a phase like acquisition and onboarding, and they're a new customer. And you nurture them, and you tell them pleasant things about your business. And then they go through, and this is, a, this is a hotel one, by the way. So they've got you know, pre-stay, during stay, departure, different comms that hotels typically send out to a guest. Um, at which point, you're a customer. You're a current customer. And if you keep staying with them regularly, they'll probably keep you as a current customer, um, or consider you as a current customer. But look, if you go away, you then go into this lost customer phase, which, again, your businesses will have, even if you sell, whether you sell to retail uh, or you know, to consumers with, with shoes or whether you sell to a business once every four years for a car, or holidays every year, whatever it might be. You will know, I expect, the frequency of which people are buying from you. If they stop buying, you again need to switch that conversation. 
So you stop trying to sell them, you start trying to win them back. Obviously, it's a very different message then, isn't it? You've got a customer, particularly a, a repeat customer, maybe an advocate, you're saying some, you know, you may be trying to upsell them, cross-sell them something, say, can you promote our staff, can you write a review on the review site, whatever it might be. If someone's a quietly slipped away lapsed customer who hasn't <coughs> purchased in the last six months, you're not saying that stuff, or you shouldn't be. You should be maybe sending them a survey, or saying to us, um, like the Crocs thing, or um, do you still need our things, or it's been six months since we've seen you. Add a bit of personality into it. Remind them why they signed up in the first place. Remind them of the services they used to have from you and why they were so wonderful. Um, remind them that thing is still there if they want it. Very different conversation at different stages of that customer life cycle. <coughs> so you have to think about that as well. Um, and start looking for yourself. This is cool. I don't think MailChimp does this. Our software does. <laughs> but, no, but no, this is, this is interesting. So this is, this is some stuff we have for some of our customers. So again, using persona-based marketing. So we've got some, a graph here with personas and, and life cycle stages. So they've got a good mix. This was, a, again, a, a trendy Tom, an impassioned faith. I mean, 20. So they've got a good mix of personas. They know who their main types of customers are. They've got a good a spread of about six different types of customers. Look, they're all lapsed. They've all gone away. So you look at this across all their different personas, it's all pink or red, which means that all those customers are kind of ex-customers. They have a very particular challenge around re-engagement, trying to get people to become repeat purchasers. I know several businesses in kind of e-commerce who have this challenge. They get one-time purchases, and then that customer goes away, never comes back again. Um, bananas. So they've got a very particular challenge on re-engagement. This, this, this customer, on the other hand, less personas, again split, but on the whole, look, they've got prospects, they've got current customers, they've got a few lost ones. But again, as a marketer, if you've got your database, okay, and you're starting, whether you do it through segmentation in MailChimp or, or whatever, but you have your different personas. You know from your data the different kinds of customers you've got. And you can then see, okay, I've got some um, couples here, I've got some family dudes, and I've got some whatevers. Uh, all my, my um, couples there, look, they're all prospects. So what I need to be doing to my couples persona is nurturing them, um, trying to you know, get them down that sales funnel. My um, family fundraisers, on the whole, I've got a retention risk. Look, they, they're mainly, they've lapsed. So the, the, message, the messaging I have to those guys can be very different. If you're trying about re retention or re-engagement, remind them of what they once had. Um, whereas the ones on the side, they've got, got a mix. But by getting that kind of insight out of your data, by kind of cross-referencing, who are these kind of guys? What kinds of customers have I got? My personas. And then by coupling that with, whether it be just general engagement with your emails to start with, or if you can tie that with your e-commerce, and you know, are these guys still consuming my product or service? Or have they quietly gone away? Or have they, has their contract um, expired? You start then finding out where the money is in your business and what money you need to protect in your business. Whether you need to sell, cross-sell, upsell, whether you need to switch that conversation to retention. Because by crikey, it's easier to make money by keeping existing customers than trying to win new ones. So don't forget to look after the ones you've got. Very different message, depending on whether they're a uh, customer, repeat customer, evangelist, gone away. Um, really try and cross-reference that stuff in terms of who your customers are and um, what stage of that customer life cycle they're in. It wouldn't be a Sims talk without this. You should all be doing this, which is just feed. All email platforms do this. It's a button you normally have to switch on. So it automatically, you've, you know UTM tags? Yeah, UTM tags. I don't know why they're saying no, they're here this no. Okay, so Sam, 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 Sam. Did you tagging? Was it about three weeks, three months ago? No, I explained it all the time. Right, so, so here's one for Sam. What does UTM stand for? Max, UTM, what does it stand for? Come on. Uh, I actually have no idea. Urchin tracking module, come on. What? Urchin tracking module. Urchin. It's the little piece of software that gives the first go. Urchin for years. I know, it's but it's still UTM, the urchin tracking module tag. Yes. So, but what you can do with this, don't ignore, don't worry about what they're called. What's really useful is the fact that in Google Analytics you can then get some really useful data because you switch this button on your email platform and every time, because you know how email platforms work, you send your email, all the links within it get turned, a bit like Twitter does, into short links, okay? When someone receives your email, that, that short link has got all kinds of goodness wrapped inside it, which indicates who they are and what the message was, 
and maybe some other kind of other stuff. Um, so when they click that link, first it goes to the email platform, which unwraps that link and gets all that goodness out. Oh look, Mary's like, opened our email or clicked her on her email on such and such a link. Um, and then it pushes that email or that link through to your website. So it's kind of a two-stage process. Email received, click on link, link goes to your platform, unwraps the goodness for your stats, goes to your website. Switch this on, when that goes back through to your website, the page that someone thought they were clicking through to, it adds all that stuff. Like the fact that that click through came from email, from your newsletter, from a particular campaign or particular message name. So if you've set up your goals and funnels, as you all should do, um, and someone converts to your website, you can see where that came from. You can then see how well your email marketing is performing for your business compared to your content marketing or your events or your blog or whatever. Really, really, and it takes no time at all. And once you've got your goals and funnels set up, you do this, and it's, you've got this for free extra data. It's just there in your, in your um, campaign sources report or whatever it's called. But it's really, really useful. Switch that button on. Okay, uh, and then just value in every email. So uh, we've talked about you know, targeting your newsletters to drive interest, desire. Um, we haven't talked about automation. It's a bit an injury, but there's some really simple things you can do. Um, so on the whole, you'll start with you know, emailing people about <coughs> you know, a newsletter with your blog posts or whatever. Interesting stuff that might find interesting and useful. Um, if they click through on certain things, you might think, oh, okay, that person actually is interested in that. Um, if they show some interest in that thing in particular, or maybe you can track them through your website, or maybe it's then they click through and then download the white paper. Use those signals to then maybe push them further down the sales funnel. So they download a general white paper about problems for shoemongers, um, and you think, aha, we've got a shoemonger prospect. Right, next thing you might do is show them about <coughs> your shoemongery services, not just generally how shoemongers can do better, which was your white paper to get someone interested, because that was their problem. Once they downloaded that, send the thing about your shoemongery services. See if they then click through on that. If they click through on that and look at your product spec sheet or whatever it might be, capture that as well. But maybe then you say, either send another follow-up or you then actually say, I'll ping an email to our salesperson or just have a little report that runs every night or every week. So you can see then who your prospects are because it is a customer life cycle. You start at the top of the funnel helping them solve their problems. They show some interest in those problems and some awareness of who you are interest in what you do, send them stuff more about what you do. Maybe give them your price list, see if they stop, a link to your price list, see if they click through to it. So you can do this for welcome series when someone signs up. How many people have got a, 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 an email newsletter right now? Right, so when someone signs up, what do you do with it? <coughs> so when they sign up, they, they come to your website and they thought, this sounds amazing. And they sign up, they give you their email address. What happens next? How many of you send them a beautiful, right? After a week, I send them an email saying, thanks for joining. Is there anything that you don't understand that you can help me? Yeah, awesome. Good. Yeah. yeah. It can be a good opportunity to, um, to engage and actually just start them on that, that customer journey. So many sites. I did a survey of about 15 hotels um, a couple of months back. Three of them did this well. Uh, about 10 of them did nothing at all. It just says on the website, thanks very much for signing up. Hang on, I've just spent five minutes of my valuable time giving my email address. I'm, I'm feeling positive about your brand. I've just signed up. And now you're ignoring <coughs> me? Crazy, crazy. Send them something. Send them a thank you. Send them maybe a, a, a voucher. So, and you can't wait to see them in your whatever it might be soon. Um, or send them whatever. But don't ignore them because that's just rude. Um, abandoned basket if you're e-commerce. Uh, again, it's one of the, the, the most useful, productive uses of email. Again, things like MailChimp and us do this well, but it's a, it's a great use case for, for, for email marketing. If someone has gone through to um, your Shopify store or whatever, and then they haven't checked out, identify that, send them something. Because sometimes, I've talked to retailers who have seen you know, evidence of this. People sometimes get all this stuff in their basket, and then the kid starts crying or it's drowning in the bath or whatever it might be, <laughs> and they have to get distracted for a second. Uh, and then they forget what they were doing. <coughs> Send them a reminder, and actually they go, oh yes, come back and finish it. Um, thank yous. Um, just when someone re-engages after a while and, and does something, just say thanks, I'm well, glad to see you back. You never know, those little things, little human things, can really help 
to start building that rapport where actually the person starts getting a perception that actually you are a company they might want to do <coughs> business with because you're nice and you didn't just ignore them. So, on the whole, more of this. Don't take this prescriptively, but, you know, start thinking. Do yourself a favour. Don't try and do everything at once. Maybe break your, your year into quarters and think, OK, well, first quarter, I'm going to do some, some lead gen to one of my personas. Think of a campaign to one of my kind of customer types. Maybe next quarter I'll do a different one. Maybe once a year, maybe, do a customer satisfaction survey from your existing customers. Just say, how do you think of our products and services? Get some real gold dust through things like that. And your email marketing can be just as powerful, if not more so, for engaging with your existing customers and retaining those customers, listening to what they want, than trying to win new ones. Um, set your objectives. Will there be engagement objectives? I want to grow my engaged database by 50 contacts a month. Not the whole database, because that's meaningless. But the, the size of my database of people who actually engage at least once every couple of months. Really, really important. That's a great metric as to whether what you're doing is working, whether people are finding it valuable and interesting. And then set some revenue objectives as well. Less of this because it's rubbish. Um, and we're done. That was an abrupt finish, wasn't it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, I don't know what the business was, but would it also be fair to say that it could be an indication that actually your product is very good for certain people and useful for others? Yes. And therefore, you should be looking at your business model. Absolutely. This, I mean, these days, I don't think anyone can afford to be a generalist in what they're doing. Any business needs to decide what its niche is or what its ideal kinds of customers are. So again, forget the guys you think should be buying from you, because maybe you're wrong, maybe you're deluded, or maybe those guys... You know. So again, you can do all your SWOT analysis on your competitors and so on, but a good starting place is look at, over the last year, who has actually bought from you. I couch that with also you've got to keep a kind of steer on your business. Um, depends on your business model. But I've spoken to, again, hoteliers, restaurateurs, who are absolutely determined, these are the kinds of customers we want. We might have those guys coming in, but we're not interested in those because that lowers the tone or whatever. So you've also got to keep a really close idea on, for your business, what you want your business to be. <coughs> but, but, but don't just think, you know, think in your head about who should be buying. Think very hard about who is buying. And if the guys you think aren't buying, yeah, reevaluate things. Think, why is that? Maybe go back to the persona thing. Think, well, okay, I think those guys should be buying. Am I not presenting it? Is my message not clear enough for those guys? Is, it, is the value proposition not quite there? Think back again to what it is they actually want from your business and therefore want from you, what problems you're solving for them. Um, but it is so valuable to do this because otherwise you're just going by, oh, we have lots of email engagement. You might be, but all your best, that might be from prospects and all your best customers are just quietly going away. And all of a sudden you've got a massive revenue issue for your business. So correlating what's happening with your emails with are they prospects, are they existing customers, are they lapse risk, really, really valuable. So then you, I mean, I do the same sort of thing as you do, so if you come across that kind of data for a client, would you go back to the client and say, oh, I think you need to have... Absolutely. Can you do that? Yes. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it, as, as it's like anything, you know, it's, um, you can't... You can't just give people software and expect them to go away and do stuff with it. The same way you couldn't, wouldn't sell a car and then never expect off someone servicing and maintenance and all the rest of it. Um, these days, people on the whole are looking for, if it's B2C, they're looking for experiences. If it's B2B, they're looking for you know, value add differentiation compared to the competitors. So I think it's a combination of services and products. Absolutely. It's not just about providing yes, yes. In my case, Yeah. Absolutely. And it's just generally marketing strategy, isn't it? You know, set some objectives for the year, go ahead, execute a plan. At the end of the year, look back on it and think, okay, well, what worked and what didn't work? Because unless you're doing that, unless you're looking at what over time, what was I, did I set out to do, did it work? Some of it worked, some of it didn't. The stuff that worked, do more of it. The stuff that didn't, change it. 
So again, it's really important to set these smart objectives. Think about what you want to achieve, what worked well last year, what didn't work well last year, set a plan and, and execute accordingly. Don't just meander on because that way you're not learning anything. So. You, you talked <coughs> earlier on about um, getting more data from your audience to get a greater understanding of their persona. Yeah. To what extent does the actual act of collecting more data, so if you're asking more, put people off? Yeah, it's a good question. Relevance? Yeah, so there's a whole thing about stuff that people kind of explicitly volunteer compared to stuff they unconsciously volunteer. So it's a change between given and observed data. So on the whole, observed data will be more reliable. So that's things like the kinds of things people are clicking on. That can be really valuable. Most systems have behavioral insights modules or things. Not necessarily what particular link that someone clicked, but what kinds of links they're clicking. So a lot of systems now have, have link tagging where you can, we call it link categories, but they have different names for it, where you can say, okay, here's an email, that link, that link, and that link are about our product. That link is about careers, and that link is about, you know, the about us. And you can then look at the kinds of things people are clicking on. What kinds of products are they looking at? Not just, and that will span, maybe run campaigns once a month for six months. You might then look and say, okay, that guy has clicked five times on product XYZ. Therefore, he's probably one of these guys. Um, customer preference centers, if it's just the straight, tell us what you want from your emails, you have to word that stuff really well and you have to live your promise. You know, you've got to really set out what's in it for someone, why they should volunteer that information to you and what they're going to get in return. Um, <coughs> is, there, is there a lot of research into how successful, I mean, my understanding, and that's only very limited really, is is almost this sort of move towards asking for less. Just an email, just get an email. Oh, to start with, oh, for sure. To start with, it's like, it's like it has to be the most frictionless experience. Yes. So, again, there's an easy one that they asked you for quite a lot. I'm not sure what kind of level of vouchers and things they're giving you in response for that. But it's like the, your website you know, conversion funnel. It's got to be as frictionless as possible. So on the whole, first <coughs> sign up, you've got to explain to someone really succinctly why they're going to sign up. Sign up here to get our blah, 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 latest off on the XYZ email address. Once they've given their email address, you've got them then, autoresponded straight away, thanks for signing up, that's really awesome, you're going to get all these wonderful things. By the way, if there's certain things you do or don't want, we don't want to spam you, we'd love to know really what you're interested in. Click here, spend two minutes, tells your preferences. By the way, you'll be entered into our prize draw. So do that as part of a journey. Again, the more expensive systems you can get, do things like progressive profiling, where ask for this. Um, and then next time you engage, if you've got that and got that, ask for this extra piece. So any one time, you're only asking for a few pieces of information. Don't ask someone for war and peace in one go because they will never fill it out. <coughs> um, exception sometimes being competitions if they're really awesome or depending on your business model, sometimes a survey where you're gonna publish the results afterwards. You can actually get people to give you quite a lot. But on the whole, bit by bit, as part of a journey. Only think, what do I need for the next step in that journey. Where do you stand on the sort of name? I mean, I go for name and email. Where do you stand on just email or name and? Yeah, it, 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 it depends. I mean, some brands like to do things like first name personalization. Yeah. Yeah. Can be okay, it can be a bit cliche, but on the whole, um, I would have a first name and a last name field, but make them optional. Depends on what real estate you've got to play on the website as well. It might be certain places, all you've got room for really is, a, is an email address. And you want to make it look really quick. Um, if you've got room for a bit more, I'd probably have, um, have them there as well. But don't start asking for things like date of birth straight away, because uh, unless there's a sensible quid pro quo for it. If there's a reason why you need date of birth, because maybe you're a pub and you need to know whether people are old enough, or you run Pokemon.com and you need to know whether they need parents' consent to download the game, um, then fine if there's a reason. But if you're like a regular B2B business and you're randomly saying to people, when, did you, when were you born? No, why are you, why are you asking for that? Um, turns people off. Depends on the business. Yes? When people sign up, would you ask for email confirmation? Yes, so that's called, um, so you're talking about double opt-in. Yeah, so on the whole, best practice, we always do. Um, so the way this works, 
sorry, I should have covered that. Um, so when someone signs up, two things you can do. One is you can just leave it at that, and they've signed up. You've got them. Um, they might have, it might have been their friends signing them up, or they might have signed up in, a, in an act of insane rage, or whatever. Um, double opt-in works by, when they sign up, you send them an email back straight away saying, thanks for signing up, that's really awesome, you're going to get all these wonderful things, but it's an anti-spam thing, we'd just like to confirm that you really do want to sign up and make sure it's really you, click this button. When they click that button, it's kind of just double, it's confirming that yes, they really did want to sign up in the first place. It's an extra step. We always f do it for our customers because that way you keep a genuinely clean list of people who genuinely do want to receive your emails. Um, otherwise, it could have been someone signed up for a joke, it could have been a, a bot trying to sign, I, I don't know why a bot would do that, but there's all kinds of things that you might get email addresses which really didn't want to be there in the first place. And these days it's so, so much about relevance and engagement, it's always worth that extra step. I yes? I understood that differently when you said about whoever was a good catch about email confirmation, about when you're asked for your email address twice, which really no I, mean, <laughs> no, I mean, these days, most people just cut and paste it from the first field to the second field anyway. And I think we have to trust people probably to um, type their email address. If they okay. want it, they'll proceed. Yeah. yeah. If, it's a, if, if, if I'm a... If, if it's things like, if it's a password where your, yes. your business is going to suffer if someone's put it in wrongly and then can't get in and phones your help desk. Oh, yes, to confirm For, for password passwords, it's really important. Email address, no. Yeah. I've not seen that for ages. Huh? Did they double in the chance? Well, of kind of, yeah. They could have entered it wrong the second time. Well, this is it. It's exactly. It's just hedging against yourself. It's miserable. Um, no, I'd always ask to just email address once. Plus, most people go to the information where you angry and ask for it twice. Most people have an autofill anyway. Yeah, exactly. So most of you go yeah. MA and then the rest of your emails are like that. Yeah, technology has moved on a bit, hasn't it? So, yeah. Yes. Hi. You said um, 30 to 40% open rate is good. Yeah. Eight, nine, ten percent engagement. You can get a lot more. When we've done things, um, certain customers where you've got a really targeted list or targeted segment you're sending to, um, you can get higher. Um, but on the whole, if you're getting ten percent of people you sent to are clicking through meaningfully on a link, that's a really good result, um, I think. Um, because people are fickle and sometimes they won't. The other thing I actually forgot, didn't say, um, really important. Don't be afraid these days to send your email again to people who didn't open it the first time. Um, you might think it's kind, of, it's kind of a spammy thing. If you're doing your targeting well, you're pretty confident this thing you've sent out, you've targeted it well, you've written some nice engaging content, it's going to be of value to your audience, and they didn't open it. You know, it might have been because <coughs> you sent it at half past 11 on a Friday night. Maybe that was a bad time. Or 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, um, also a very bad time. Um, so. Sometimes we just get it wrong, or sometimes people just aren't in their inbox when you expect them to be. <coughs> a lot of systems have send time optimization now, but if, if, you d if you're not using that, don't be afraid if you thought, you know what, this is valuable. Don't send it again to everybody. That's horrible, because the person who's got it and opened it the first time is thinking, why are you sending this to me again? Unsubscribe. But to people who missed it the first time, wait maybe three, four, five days. Don't try again straight away, because it looks like it's fine. But wait three, four, five days. Send it a different day of the week, maybe a different time. We've seen some really good results. Actually, you can go from your, your click-through rates going from 2% up to 10%. Your opens going from maybe 20% up to maybe 50%. Um, because people don't catch it the first time around. And people these days have so much email. And if they, if they miss it in their inbox, they may not come back to it. So you would or send exactly the same I would often, if I'm right. doing that again, I would, might change the subject line a bit. Because that way, again, they won't associate it with that one that maybe they did scan in their inbox. Why are they sending it again? Send it with a slightly different subject line. Still, the subject line needs to reflect what's in the email. Really important. Subject line, pre-header, main heading, content. It's got to tell a story. Um, but maybe tweak the subject line a bit so it's something slightly different. Maybe the first hook wasn't quite right. But don't be afraid to wait a bit and resend to your non-openers because it can improve your results. And then maybe they just missed it. Did it say in brackets on that? That slide, it said something like, don't, not trusted data or something, because that's what always worries me. I don't do that, and that's yeah. because I have exactly the hit rates that you have. I have a 100% clean list and 30% because that's yeah. it click through. Um, <coughs> but I don't tend to resend it, because I always wonder how many people have read it in the browser and not opened it. They just wanted the date and they put it in the diary. Do you know what I mean? So I'm a bit nervous of, 
doing that, but you think they should. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, we could, we could talk about specific yeah. examples, but on the whole, we've seen that it really doesn't hurt and it can actually help quite a lot. Um, we've seen examples of people who've sent like a whole s series of, you know, quite a lot of people can feel how often should I send, how frequent should I send. So long as what you're sending is genuinely useful and valuable to your audience, then I mean, it depends on your business. Mm -hmm. their problems, yeah, and as so long as you're sending stuff which is going to help them solve problems, they shouldn't worry and they should welcome it. Um, but it's all about telling that story and reminding people why they're getting your stuff. Um, make sure the main thing is to make sure it's generally valuable and useful for people who are sending it to. You mentioned bad time delays for Tinder emails. Yeah. What, is there a, a good time generally or does it depend on the market? It depends a bit. I mean, B2B on the whole, kind of Tuesdays, Thursdays thing, not Monday mornings because everyone's too busy, Fridays everyone's clocking off. Um, depends on the, the email, but on the whole, Tuesdays, Thursdays-ish is good. Uh, B2C, although again, B2B, it's almost like this whole consumerization of business these days. My business emails, I tend to read at about seven o'clock at night when I'm bathing my six-year-old daughter because that's the only spare time I get. That drowning story wasn't true. No, the drowning, <laughs> no, no. No, Max, no, God, no. Um, all that, well, no, no, no. Um, it varies, it really does. Um, it's the kind of thing, some platforms give you these, some stats on that kind of stuff, but you'll find it kind of scatters a bit. Um, there's no easy answer to that, but not m nine o'clock Monday mornings, not Friday nights. If you're a consumer business, depends on who you're targeting, <coughs> but probably not too late at night. Again, also think about channels. I mean, we're talking email here. Uh, we work with Urban Vintage in town. And they're like fashion retailer. Um, coming up to their, their sale days, they will send the emails out on the, on the Thursday and the Friday, run up the sale to get people into store. They'll also use SMS um, on the morning of the sale often, but only to people within a certain radius, just, and they will drive people into store like crazy because they've got the text are so immediate, and, and they know they're, and they're targeting the local people through that channel as well. Amazing for driving people footfall into stores. So again, you need to think about the different channels you're using uh, and, and who you're sending through for, for why. But I think business and consumer are coming kind of that, who here doesn't read emails in the evening now? You know, and we're becoming like this four platform society now where in the mornings we're on mobile on the morning commute and we're reading the news. During the day we're on a laptop um, in the evening, we're typically on a tablet. So if you're selling to consumers, um, the best time is in the evening because they might look at it during the day, but they're then going to be saying, I'll bookmark that for later. I've not got time now, my boss will kill me. They're not going to do it in the mornings or on a smartphone. In the evening, they're watching EastEnders or whatever street on a tablet, and that's when they're making their purchases. So your e-commerce sites should be tablet optimized and you should target your comms for that kind of time of day. Um, depends on the business, but absolutely. Yeah, it depends on your business. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, ga gather what data you think you can, because data is the, n the new kind of currency, along with trust. So the other currency, I think we are a trust economy these days as well. Um, you know, people talk about big data. It's not, it's not the size of your data that matters, it's what you do with it. And that's all about accurate, up-to-date data used responsibly with the recipient's permission. So um, trust becomes really important. There needs to be a reason why you're gathering the data in the first place. I mean, Facebook's gone crazy on this now. You cannot capture data now through a Facebook app unless you can persuade Facebook there's a good reason why you need that data. Um, I think trust on the whole is so, so important and not abusing that. One last question. Can we use your system in the same way that we as small businesses produce MailChimp? Can we use what the usual system do you sell it to people like us? I do sell it to people like you, but for, 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 a, for a sum of money. We don't, have a fr we, don't have a, we don't have a freemium model at the moment. Uh, we don't have a freemium model at the moment. Um, but 
it is for sale. Um, and if, if you'd like a demo, I could show you a demo. It's very awesome. Um, but it, we don't have a freemium model. We do. I'll post it next month. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much for being so patient with me. Thank you. It would be great to get more local businesses. Okay, I'm going to be like. um, really brief with this because it's getting a little bit warm in here and uh, it's getting late. Uh, I'm going to do two things, and I normally only do one, so I have doubled the amount of pressure on myself. But luckily, they're both very short, and hopefully, they're not too technical or anything like that. Um, if you've never been before, um, I usually do a rundown. Most people in here own a small company or have clients who are small companies or you're a sole trader or you do something where you interact with uh, the internet in some way, probably while you're here. So um, we generally put together a list of things that may affect the industry as a whole. Um, this list is shorter than any other time of the year because it's February and nobody releases anything in February, so there's not a lot going on, so it's going to be very, very brief. Um, a couple of bits of follow-up. One was uh, I mentioned a couple of months ago that Google are going to allow you to send money via email. Um, there's a little button in Gmail. It's now fully live in the UK, so you can actually send money to people. Thank you, Justin. Um, just from your email account. So if you do have very informal relationships with clients and they want to um, pay you just via Gmail, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly effective. It's just right there next to the send button um, for those email-based purchases. Um, Twitter and Google are two services that you presumably use to speak to customers all the time. They have just done a deal. I don't know if anyone remembers when tweets used to show up in Google. It was many years ago, um, and then they all fell out, and it was very, uh, it's like a, a relationship gone bad. They've got back together. Someone gave someone millions of dollars, and they have <coughs> worked through it. Um, they're going to start appearing officially in the search results. So for those of you who have tweeted and said that it doesn't do anything for Google, they've got back together. No one knows what it's going to look like yet, but I should imagine tests will start showing up very, very, very shortly. Um, so for those of you that have been tweeting, I, I don't know what it's going to look like, but we'll, we'll try and report back as quickly uh, as I can. Um, for those of you that have more than one of you running a Twitter account, but don't want to pay for Hootsuite and Sprout Social and things like that, um, they usually charge a freemium model, so they'll usually be free for one or two people, but maybe you have three or four who want to use the same Twitter account. Um, TweetDeck is Twitter's official um, app that they support. They have now launched Team um, Access. So it's called TweetDeck Teams. So if there's two, three, or four of you running a company's Twitter account or a local club or an organization or anything like that, um, Twitter now support that natively through TweetDeck only. Other than um, sharing the password, there's no other way to do it through Twitter officially. Um, for those of you that use AdWords to sell people your products and services, um, we have lots of clients who don't sell online. They want people to pick up the phone and call them. AdWords now supports phone call only campaigns. There is no other, there is no click through to a website. There is no make me go to a web page. The only conversion for the, for the ad that you have just sold someone is that they, they only show on the phone, so they only show on a mobile phone, and the person clicks the ad and the phone tries to call the number. There isn't a website to go through, there's no, no, nothing else. You have bid on that someone touching the, um, the link and, and picking up the phone. Is that your number or is it still one of their weird redirect ones? Um, it's still one of their weird, weird, how else would they track it if it wasn't one of their weird redirect ones? But you can alter the copy of the app. So it, it, yeah, I think it will always be, they're never just gonna wire you through, but it will, uh, it gets to you. It is you at the end of the phone. They haven't replaced you, which would be amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, for those of you that use Webmaster Tools, I tell you every month to try and use Webmaster Tools and go and check all the information about your traffic. There has been a bit of a bug in it. I tell you to use it and then they break it. Um, Webmaster Tools data is not real time. It's not like analytics. It lags a few days behind. It tells you what people, words have, been, uh, what people have been searching for on Google to find your website. Um, it's been really delayed. I've uh, put a link to an article in there. Uh, apparently, it got up to about five to seven days delayed. I, I assume that's fixed. I haven't seen any follow-up to it yet, but I will take a look. Um, but I think it's coming back now. So if you noticed that your data wasn't up to date, that's why there's a little report on it there. Um, lots of people who run business listings, uh, Google shows pictures of your business. If people search for your brand name specifically, or maybe you run a restaurant in Ipswich and your photo comes up, or you know, shoe mongers if you're Justin, um, you've never been able to control what image actually appeared. So if you had a Google Plus or a Google My Business page and you put up 
three pictures of your lovely office and one of you doing that, uh, they always use the one of you doing that and not the other or the other way around. You can now choose through Google My Business which images show on the Google search results if you would like them to. So you can pick that. So they're, they're trying to let you every month brand a little bit more of that experience um, if people are looking for you directly or if those images are showing up. Um, and because it has been a very short month, this is a link to a service. This isn't any kind of news or anything, but I, I saw this pop up. Um, as a user and I thought, oh, okay, this is something really useful. Um, you may have come across this. This is fairly new in browsers, so if you use Chrome or Firefox or Safari, kind of a modern browser and, and new versions of Internet Explorer. Um, you now can have um, notifications within your browser. So it's, it's kind of like notifications on your phone when you've got a text message when something happens. You can now have those in the browser. So Chrome will do them. And you'll get websites that ask you, would you like to receive notifications from bobswebsite.com? Um, and if you love the stuff that bobswebsite.com puts out, you can say, yes, I would like to receive that. And he can then send you information from bobswebsite.com when you're not actually on Bob's website, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's all through the browser, so you're basically opting in. There is a service called goroost.com. I haven't used it, but I did see it and think it was interesting if you want to go and try it out. They are providing a kind of way that you don't need a developer to put this kind of thing on your website because normally nerds like me need to get involved and install things and things need to happen. And basically what, um, <laughs> because the technology is so early, people won't necessarily be quite as good at clicking no, I don't want that, as they will be in about six months. So if you want to try and get in there early and every time you post a new product or a blog post or whatever it is you want to tell your audience, it is yet another way to interrupt their day and give them something to do rather than get on with whatever it was they tried to do when they sat down at the computer. Um, so that's another product and service. There's a link in there. Uh, check it out. I haven't used it. Um, so a disclaimer, if it's rubbish, I accept no responsibility. But if you do use it and it's great, please let me know. I am very interested. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm going to give me a 30 second delay. So talk amongst yourselves. We're going to do a massive context switch and then we're going to do Sam's 10 minute takeaway without the Sam part. Well, so we did like 10 minutes instead of um, the Okay, yep, no, that's the talking amongst yourselves part over. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that section. Um, this is Sam's 10 minute takeaway. Sam hasn't been very well. Normally, um, the whole point of these 10 minute takeaways is to give you something useful and practical to take away that you might be interested in. It was also so that Sam could learn about a new topic every month. As I have written this from scratch, and she didn't have a chance because she was ill, hopefully we're gonna educate Sam as well, so there will be a test at the end just for you. Um, <laughs> Has anyone heard of the, the term SSL? Have you heard of, of encryption? Okay, so everyone knows. How many people actually know and understand what that is? Okay, so about, how about half the people? Okay. Um, <coughs> can get a bit technical. Going to not do that. Just how it relates to you and how it relates to you as someone who owns and runs a website or how it relates to you as a consumer that uses and purchases things from websites regularly. What is it? The most basic place to start. It stands for Secure Socket Layer. Um, it's actually been replaced. It's been fairly deprecated now and by um, TSL, which is Transport Security Layer, Transport Sockets Layer, one of those two. Should have, should have written that down somewhere. Um, I've actually got my notes, but they're not uh, available. Um, so you'll sometimes see SSL and TSL. And you'll often hear about SSL certificates. That's the other thing that people say. Go, this certificate is invalid. The certificate has happened. No one sends you a certificate. There is no physical piece of paper. No one has issued a real life stamp of approval on anything wonderful. It is a technical term because nerds like to call things weird things. Mm -hmm. And then you have certificate authorities and you imagine something arriving in the post and opening it up and thinking, yes, I now can have websites. Uh, it's not, um, an SSL certificate is just some numbers and letters. It's just a nerdy little file that sits on a server somewhere. There is no certificate or anything like that. And it is that. That is the most common representation of what you recognize as an SSL is your interaction with SSL. And that sits in the top left-hand corner of your browser, and a little green padlock means that something has happened with SSL, something has gone on. And the HTTPS, every time you get a little uh, URL in the top of your browser, it says HTTP, something, something, something. And then if you're secure, that's what the S stands for, um, then it says HTTPS, and everything goes green, and there's pictures of padlocks, and you all feel wonderful uh, about uh, life in general. Um, I, there is going to be a bit more specifics, it's not just general uh, colours. 
It means that your connection to the website that you have visited is encrypted. It means that the data sent, I should have grabbed this off Wikipedia, but I wrote this, so if this turns out to be slightly incorrect, then bear with me. Uh, the data sent between your browser and the server at the other end can't be read by anybody that intercepts it. The data itself could still technically be intercepted, but the idea is that it's encrypted. So it doesn't mean anything to anybody unless you are one of the people at the other end, which is great. So it's secure, it is private, it is your connection. However, what it is not, it is not trustworthy. And this is something that's really misconstrued in SSL all of the time. There is a really um, massive drive to make people feel great that when there's a green padlock, you are good to go. You can have a secure encrypted connection to a very bad person. You are securely connected to IamStealingYourData.com is totally fine. <laughs> if you own IamStealingYourData.com, buy an SSL certificate, install it. That connection will be incredibly secure and encrypted and strong. Um, you can still then steal people's data. That is slightly where the certificate authorities things like that come in. Make sure you trust the person that you are connected to. And if you ha are a website owner and you want to install SSL certificates, which is in just a second, you people still need to know who you are and trust you. What you're saying is, I've, can, I've encrypted this data between us, but you still have to know who I am. So if you're buying things, it, it's not just a free license to go, yeah, take my credit card details. Can't wait for my wonderful free things to arrive. Should I have one on my website? If you are a website owner or provider or a service provider, advice is conflicting um, and it can be a little bit confusing. As usual, this is the answer to all of these questions all of the time. Most mainstream providers, PayPal will, will handle this for you. The most common use of it is for credit card information. Payment information, um, if you are um, uh, registered um, at the Information Commission offices as a data protection person, you might want to secure uh, people's data that you take in. If you're using things like PayPal, Shopify, most good branded trustworthy products will probably have taken care of this for you. If you <coughs> use PayPal buttons, for example, when they click on the button, you'll see the padlock go green, a certificate will be authenticated, and everything will be taken care of for you. So for most use cases, for most small companies, if you're using a good branded supplier, um, you probably have this taken care of for you. You should see the green icon. It's essentially, if you want to do it and you're not using those, or you want to encrypt the bit before that, sometimes you only get the PayPal bit that's encrypted and your website isn't. Um, sometimes it's about trust. So um, anyone looking for a signal of trust that you are, you know, a cut above other websites, they can look for those type of things. They're looking for big green icons uh, in Chrome. Uh, the website that we run is SSL encrypted from end to end. Every single page is encrypted by default. We don't have any, even if you're just browsing the, the general website, other than encrypted. Um, but it is not mandatory, it doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean they can't get to your website if they don't. People knew and trusted that little gold padlock that used to be in the top left hand corner, then they moved it, then they changed its color, then they changed what it looked like, and then people kept putting different padlocks everywhere, so now no one knows what that looks like. Um, however, Google wants to encourage us to encrypt the entire web. They've started a campaign called HTTPS Everywhere. Um, and then this happened, which is one of the biggest uh, indicators of how serious they are about it. Google explicitly stated that they are using HTTPS as a ranking indicator for SEO. This does not mean that this is me saying, if you want to get good SEO, put an SSL encryption, <coughs> uh, an SSL certificate on your site. This is not me saying that. This is an edge case for people that really want to go the whole hog and what is the incentive for you. Um, and if you feel it's a, it's a, you know, there are finances involved. But they are explicitly saying Google wanted to encrypt everything. They're encouraging those big providers, uh, Squarespace, um, Shopify, people like that, to encrypt everything. How do I get one for my site? Uh, it depends, but generally you give someone some money um, and then you have a developer install it. This stuff is not generally off the shelf unless it's by someone like PayPal. You generally have to get someone quite technical involved. This is it. So certificate authorities, they're the people who generally hand these certificates out for the most part. You can make your own, but in general, um, so names like VeriSign, GeoTrust, um, those are kind of companies that you've probably seen on those little um, symbols and things like that. So there is no technical difference between um, a very secure certificate that you've bought from 20 quid from Trust, Trustico, I think is the one that we have used a couple of times, um, from a brand that no one has heard of, than from VeriSign. The price difference is anything from um, 
you know, 40 pounds up to, you know, 1,000, 2,000 pounds for a certificate for the ver VeriSign Trust. Sometimes there are difficult implementations, but for most of the time, for most standard use cases, um, well, the caveats in there, generally you're paying for the brand name. The technical implementation, there's not a lot of difference in most of them. Um, but having a little VeriSign thing or having the name in the little green icon, which you can now do in Chrome, is gets, starts to get really expensive. But it is not, um, it is, it is not a, a technical issue at all. This is why it's, that first slide wasn't me saying, yes, you should definitely have one. Google love it. You'll get great SEO rewards. If this goes wrong, this happens. Um, has anyone ever seen this error in Chrome before? Lots of people nodding. If you accidentally misconfigure your SSL certificate, which has happened to clients that we have had and every developer I know has had, that shows up when you try and visit the website and everybody freaks out. Suddenly your phone is ringing uh, dramatically. I've never caused one of those, luckily, but uh, seen a few. Um, <coughs> this is really common as well. Has anyone see, has seen this on Internet Explorer? Lots of people nodding for that one. This is the most common one. Um, the, I don't want to get technical, but this actually happens when some of the content on a page is encrypted and some of it isn't. And the browser isn't sure whether you're trying to be ripped off because you're being told that it's secure and actually some of it's not. The bit where they're asking for your credit card details isn't. And so what they decided to do was, oh, we'll just let them know. They'll know exactly what this means. Don't worry. They'll, they'll make the right call at this point. Um, no one knew what to do. Everybody picked one and clicked that one every time. And so it was just generally, uh, if you clicked no and the thing you needed to happen didn't happen, next time you saw it, you clicked yes. And from then on, you just clicked yes. It didn't matter if they wanted your credit card details. You just clicked yes forever. Um, so be very careful. This is legitimately technical. So um, they are about security and trust. They're about credit card details. If you need one at the scale that many of us are working at very small scales, you probably already have one provided for you. Um, and if you think that you need one and you don't, find someone like me and say, this sounds technical. I really have some specific questions here. What should I do? And ask that guy. And that is it. Did that tell me 10 minutes? Was that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Does that make any sense? That's it. Does anyone have a better understanding of SSL at the end of it? <laughs> People are nodding. Just, I'm taking that as a win. Yeah. But, but just one question. I was just with, with our site, we start we start with a HTTP. Yep. And then as they go to the purchase page, they go to a secure element. Of it. Really common. Is, yeah. is there any sort of weighting in terms of are people more likely because it starts secure all the way to purchase or? No, so people. Uh, so nerds like me would pay attention to stuff like that, but even I understand if I'm a consumer and I'm uh, browsing your site and you know, say it's an e-commerce site and I'm buying shoes um, and I'm, I'm adding five shoes to my basket and then you take me to the checkout bit and then the checkout gets secure. Um, I understand what's happening there. Um, I, I have no data to back this up, but I would be wildly surprised if you took nine, or t you know, nine out of ten people off the street and they went, yes, I'm very concerned about a lack of SSL encryption when I'm browsing for shoes. Uh, so no, I've never seen that being a, a practical issue. Um, the only time I've ever seen that crop up as an issue is when the developer has screwed up the transition from one to the other and they lose their basket, uh, which I have seen happen not for a long time, but it used to happen all of the time, uh, which was very uh, unfortunate because you, you would put five pairs of shoes in your basket and then get to check out and go, oh, they're not hitting, you have to go back to the whole thing. But no, generally, uh, it's pretty good. And if you're using, as I said, if you're using off-the-shelf stuff, you should probably be good to go. Uh, when you go. That's it, all done. Okay, question. So you mentioned a, a case of getting certificates. Yep. Because it's 20 pound rather than 2,000 pounds. Yeah. Uh, so um, I have bought certificates from many places, um, and I'm not endorsing any of them recently. Uh, the last one I bought was from DNS Simple. Um, we've used Trustico, tr uh, I don't know how you put it, T-R-U-S-T-I-C-O. Um, we bought from GeoTrust directly. I've had clients buy from GeoTrust directly. Um, had clients that use Verisign directly. I think but they're expensive, so generally corporate, I think, was using those. Um, there, as I said, there isn't actually much of a technical difference. So if you're the developer like me, um, someone has given someone some money and then a very small file turns up and it has to be installed on the server and things. So, um, it, 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 if you get from someone that you trust, one of the, um, I won't get too technical for everyone else, but one of the biggest issues I've ever found is um, the ease of actually reissuing the certificate for the developer was more hassle than the purchasing because if they want to 
um, you know, change something about it or something like that. We needed to get the, the reissuing certificates. But by that point, you're probably working with a developer who maybe has a preferred supplier or, or something like that. So um, it, it can get technical. So, uh, But I, I had a good experience with uh, Trustico and GeoTrust, I think, were, were both fine. <coughs> uh, and they, I think we pay... Uh, ours is $99 a year. We use DNS Sync, but we pay $99 a year for a wildcard SSL. Uh, thank you. So I'll leave this back up.